Welcome back, everyone, for our afternoon session. I'm Molly Crockett, and I will welcome us all into this moment together with a grounding for our next speaker, Melissa Nelson. I'd like to invite you to close your eyes and bring your awareness to the element of water in your body, blood, sweat, tears, feel the fluidity as the water element moves around your being. And now connect the water element in your body with the water outside, the raindrops held in the clouds with their potential to give life, the water rushing through the river down the hill, if you're here, or the water that is in the ground, wherever you are in the world. And now connect the element of water inside your body with the water outside. And now bring your awareness to the element. To the element of fire. Fire <laughs> in your body and our technology. <laughs> the heat in your belly all the metabolic processes that sustain life, digesting your food, giving your energy, feel that warmth. And now connect it with the element of fire outside, fire deep in the earth. Fire coming from the sun. Fire in the life that is all around us. And now bring your awareness to the element of air in your body, your breath, Feeling it fill your lungs, sensation of the breath as it crosses the tip of your nose, the space in between your organs, your cells, and now connect the air element with the air outside, the wind, a feeling of infinite space. Feel the air element flowing from your inside to the in-between, to the all-around. And now bring your awareness to the element of earth in your body, flesh, bones. Feel the solidity of your body as the earth holds you. And make the connection with the earth element outside.
the trees, the grass, the dirt. Feel the connection between the elements of earth, air, fire, water, inside, in between, and all around. And hold that awareness of this connection. Bring it to a quiet, gentle place. And return your awareness to this group we have here together. Open your eyes and we will receive a teaching from Melissa. I will just take a moment to switch with Molly and do a brief introduction of Melissa Nelson. Uh, Melissa is now at the University of Arizona since August, uh, Arizona State, excuse me, thank you, um, and where you're a professor of indigenous sustainability in the School of Sustainability. And you were at uh, San Francisco State University for quite a long time before that. Melissa has engagements abroad, across a broad range of not just academic areas, but also community-based engagement. You can read more about her on the program page. And also there are a number of, uh, Melissa has supplied a number of publications uh, for you to read on the resource page. So don't forget about the resource page for the program. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. We'll hear from Roshi with a response, and then we're gonna be moving on to Molly after that. Melissa. Bujun and Dinaway Maganatug. I greet you all as relatives. Melissa Nelson and Dijini Kaz. That is my English name. Makunsi Gabawik Yidashnindigo. My Ojibwe name is Makunsi Gabawik, Young Bear Woman Standing. Nin Anishinaabe Ikwe. I identify as an Anishinaabe woman. I'm a member of the Lynx clan. And I'm a proud member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians in North Dakota. These flesh and bones were raised in Pomo Coast Miwok territory in Northern California. I'm very honored to live on Coast Miwok territory on the flanks of Mount Tamalpais, very special place I know to many of you here as well. Hello to everyone across the planet. What an honor to be speaking to people across Mother Earth. Thank you for being here. I know it's late at night or early in the morning. And I'm so grateful to the Upaya Zen Center and to Roshi Joan, my Dharma sister, Wendy Johnson, uh, Kodo Noah, and everyone who has put this together. It's truly an honor to be here. I'm very humbled like the, like the muskrat. So I also want to share about those elements, Molly, and really thank you for grounding us in that, in the blessing of rain. And we are on the lands of the Tiwa speaking Pueblo and peoples. And there are seven Pueblos that surround us here and another you know, 12 uh, down south. And to really honor and recognize the 19 proud native nations of New Mexico that have been here since time immemorial and their soil, if you were able to hold a piece of soil or rock in your hand, that is something that they have cultivated and loved and been nourished by, buried their dead in, grew their food in for countless generations. And that relationship now is tenuous, it's precarious, right, for all of us, especially for many indigenous peoples who have been displaced as Molly, uh, pardon me, as Laura shared with us earlier. And yet the Puebloan people have been solid and strong, rooted here in their homelands for thousands of years. And that is a real strength, I think, of this place, the Upaya Zen Center, being 
being so firmly rooted in this strong native land. So we always remember the people whose land we are on. I also acknowledge my own ancestors seven generations back, the ones who gave me life. On my mother's side, uh, the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Métis, the French fur trappers um, that mixed early on up in the Canadian shield, um, that had a lot of relationships with beaver and muskrat. I also honor my father's heritage, Norwegian settler, American, going back to Norway, crossing that water, and now um, many generations in the Northern Plains in North Dakota, where both my parents are from. So I honor those ancestors as well to root myself here with you. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna start my slideshow. Do you see it on? Oops, I don't need video. Share screen. I was so, ooh, I was so honored to be invited to speak about recreation and sense making and world making. And the first thing that came to me was Muskrat and this earth diver story. And this is an important narrative of the Ojibwe people. There are many different versions of this in Indian country, as we say, throughout Turtle Island, our native name for North America. There are many earth diver stories, um, but ours is very unique in particular to us. It represents our epistemology, our worldview, and we need to embrace alternative worldviews, alternative epistemologies, if we're going to make sense of this world and recreate something of justice. I wanna ground you a little bit in the sacred geography and the landscape of the greater Anishinaabe Nation or Anishinaabe Confederacy. So um, we are a large tribe, one of the largest in North America. We cover five states and three provinces. Uh, we are connected to the Potawatomi and the Odawa, we're often called the Three Fires Confederacy. And we are neighbors with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Great Six Nations. Um, we originally came from the East Coast on the Salty Sea and then migrated into the inland freshwater seas. And I will share that story a little later, our seventh fire prophecy, and why I think that's relevant and important for us today. My particular band, the Turtle Mountain Band, we were originally on Lake Superior on both the northern side in Canada and then the southern side. We were bifurcated by um, the international border. Um, that we call the medicine line. That's a whole other story. But we are a border tribe. We often don't think of tribes in the north as border tribes as much as those in the south, but we are border tribe as well. So some of our people went north into Manitoba and some went south uh, into Minnesota. And then my band got moved even further out into the plains. So we adopted some of the plains ways as well with our frenemies, our enemy friends, the Lakota and Dakota and Nakota and the Cree. Um, so we're considered Plains Ojibwe, and that's where um, my people are from, and I have a current land back project happening there too in the Turtle Mountains, which is very exciting. So I want to talk to you about the Anishinaabe recreation story, and I call it recreation because it doesn't really have a, a beginning and an end. We have a specific creation time that we refer to, uh, with the creation of Turtle Island and the Great Flood and the creation of our lands and our peoples and our traditions and our life ways. 
But these oral narratives, if anyone who's studied, and I know Roshi Joan has studied folklore, they really are cyclical. And you can pick them up anywhere. And they are in motion, constant motion in a spiral. Uh, and every version is situational and contextual. So the story I will share with you today after these rains and this mix between spring and uh, summer, uh, it will be a unique story um, for this moment. So these are recreation stories that are deeply tied to our annual renewal ceremonies. And all tribes have ceremonies of renewal um, so that we can become new again and make new worlds. And they happen every season. Every tribe is different as well because our seasons are different. Um, so they are cyclical, relational. We talk about um, the before times times before times, we talk about the before worlds and the after worlds. So this whole idea of precariousness and worlds coming to an end and worlds being recreated is not new to us and we're not afraid of it because we have many, many stories and experiences of this happening over and over throughout time. It's really important that in, to understand in our one creation story that we really honor, um, kind of like Genesis, I guess you would say, uh, that humans were the last to be created. All of the plants, all of the animals, even as we say the creepy crawlies, the bugs, humans came after the bugs, the insect world. And so they are our elders. Um, and we are the original biomimics, or I would prefer to say eco-harmonics. We, we harmonize with the ecology. We harmonize with the ecological systems that we find ourselves in, in our homelands. And so we look to the animals as our elder brothers and sisters. These are some clan relatives that are very close to me and my family. Um, obviously, the lynx through the lynx clan of the north. Um, on the right, the turtle. I'm from the Turtle Mountains, and there's a whole creation story about our Turtle Mountains. They're tiny little range that jets up out of the massive northern plains where the glaciers scraped everything back but left this little paw full of dirt, which is our Turtle Mountains. Also through my name, I'm related to the Makwa, the bear, Makunzi, the young bear standing up. And then as we got pushed into the plains and learned some of the ways of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, Cree, Blackfeet, we became buffalo hunters as well. My great grandfathers were buffalo hunters um, in the Northern Plains and we're bringing back the buffalo now, which is very exciting. And it's interesting to note that even the word totem, right? You've all heard that word, all have some meaning or connotation for it. It's an Ojibwe word. It comes from our word dodame, which is actually related to the heart. Ode is heart. So it is the place of your heart where you find your kinship in your community. And so for us, the clan system really determines your social function. It gives us meaning. It gives us purpose. Um, being related to the lynx and the bear clan, we are the protectors. Um, we're out on the edge, always kind of, you know, moseying around on the edge. And because we're out in the woods a lot, um, we are medicine people often connected to plants uh, and the earth. The fish people, the underwater people, uh, they are often connected to the spiritual mystics because they're in that other world of water. Um, the birds um, are often the leaders, the orators, the speakers. They have sight, they fly over and can see the land, and then they can squawk loud, right? Um, they know how to um, get the people moving. So these are just some of the lessons of the clan relatives um, that are so important in our creation stories uh, and in our social systems. And now I wanna share a bit of the story of the great flood. And every culture has it, right? Every culture around the world has this universal archetypal story of a great flood. Uh, and our Ojibwe one is similar in many ways and different in other ways, getting back to your, your starting conversation, has great similarities, great differences. Um, ulti ultimately, it's about cleansing, right? It's about renewal, uh, but it's also about cooperation in precarious times. 
it's very much about that. And with climate change today, we see we are getting floods in some places, droughts in other places. So water is showing up in precarious ways now due to climate change. So this story really helps us understand some of the ways we may be able to navigate. That's another um, metaphor I love, navigate these turbulent times and turbulent waters. So you may have heard a version of this story that was wonderfully popularized by Robin Kimmerer in her great book, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, where she talks about Sky Woman falling. And that's one version of the story, more from the Eastern Ojibwe, more closely connected to the Haudenosaunee that are more matriarchal. And so the woman falling is a very key character. And I love that story and tell that version. But another version of that story is our Nana Buju, our trickster character. So Nana Buju is part human. He's the first human, kind of like Jesus, Jesus Christ. He's a uh, half human, half man. And um, he falls from the sky. That's a whole other story, but I'll just get to where he's falling. And like Sky Woman falling from the sky, nowhere to land, but the great turtle comes up and, and, and creates a place for uh, Nana Buju to land on. And he says, what's going on? There's no land. There's, there's no place to grow our villages and grow our food. And what are we going to do? And Turtle says, I've been swimming for so long. I'm so tired. What am I going to do? We need help. We need help from the animals. Here comes the loon flying in. I can help. I need a place to land. I've been flying so long. I'm so tired. And then the duck pops up. Me too. I've been just going around and around and I can't find any land. So the air critters come down. Pretty soon the, the uh, sea critters come around. Here comes fast otter cruising around, has lots of energy, but even otter said, I'm tired, I can't keep swimming. We need some earth, we need some land. Uh, beaver comes up too, I have no wood to chew on. What am I going to do? I'm really getting tired. And then here comes little Wojoshk, our muskrat. You know, muskrat, me too, me too, I'm the smallest, I'm so tired, I can't swim anymore, what are we going to do? So they all hung on to turtle, and they had counsel, they had cooperation. They didn't agree on a lot of things, but they went round and round and discussed how they can figure out getting some earth so they can have some land. And so finally, Nana Buju, in his great divine inspiration, he said, you know, underneath this primal sea, there's got to be some earth down here. I remember hearing about the earth before this flood. So one of us has to dive down there and get some earth, and then we can work with that. And um, right away, Beaver said, I'm, I'm a great swimmer. I've got my big tail. I know what to do. I'm going to get down there and get some earth. Fantastic. Everyone was really behind Beaver, the strong uh, water animal. Beaver dove down and they were just sitting there waiting patiently, just tense. It was precarious. It was deep. It was dark. They didn't know what was under there. They waited a long time. They started to get really worried. All of a sudden, they see some bubbles coming up. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes Beaver. Here it comes Beaver. They look down, Beaver comes up, passed out. They shake Beaver, shake Beaver. He kind of comes through, drowned, almost drowned. He says, I couldn't see anything. It was just dark water, dark, cold water, nothing down there. I couldn't do it. I'm so sorry. So then Loon, Loon says, I'm a great diver. I know how to dive down. Loon went fly away up in the sky and then dove down. He said, Loon can do it. Loon can do it. And they waited and they waited. Same thing. They were very excited and then they got very worried. Sure enough, here comes Loon floating up, just uh, gasping, gasping. Nothing. I saw no earth, just darkness, just cold water. I couldn't find anything. There's nothing down there. Find the little muskrat said, I can go, I can go, I, I think I can make it. And everyone said, you little muskrat, you are the smallest, you are tiny, you're weak. You couldn't do it. If, if beaver couldn't do it or loon couldn't do it, you couldn't do it. So then duck, duck is like, I've got, I'm a great swimmer. I think I can do this. So you get the story. Duck goes down, gone a long time. 
nothing. In some versions of the story, all the animals perish. I'm not going to tell that version. <laughs> and little duck comes bubbling up, uh, uh, gasping, gasping, and uh, opens his beak, and uh, nothing. He said, I saw something. I saw there was some earth down there. I saw it, but I couldn't reach it. I was, I was out of air. And, and little muskrat, I can do it. I can do it. And finally, Nana Buju says, you know, you've all tried. Thank you. But I really think let's give muskrat a chance. We're out of options here. And little muskrat said, I'm, I'm so willing. I want to do this. So boom, muskrat goes down. Again, they're just like praying and like hoping and like sending good energy. Muskrat's the one. We're going to get this earth. <laughs> Come on, even though he's the littlest and he's tiny, you know, there's doubt, lots of doubt. And then um, nothing. Oh my God, we knew it. He was too small, too little. He didn't make it. We're not even going to see him. All of a sudden, little bubbles start coming up, coming up, floats up, but he's gone. He's gone. No, like, Nanabushu grabs him out of the water and holds him. He's limp, wet. But he sees in his little paw, he's clenching his little paw. And he says, what? what's this? And Nanabushu slowly opens it up, and there's a little mound of mud. And he said, he did it. He did it. And so he takes that little mound, and he puts it on Turtle's back. Turtle says, here, here puts that little mound on and they all start rejoicing and singing and just laughing and Nanabushu is so touched by the sacrifice and the courage of little muskrat he says he calls on Gichimanado the great spirit and says I need to blow the four winds in from the north from the south from the east from the west and Nanabushu took that sacred breath A little muskrat revived. And he said, Muskrat, you did it. You did it. The littlest one. He's like, I know I could do it. He said, Yeah, you died, but we revived you. <laughs> and so from that, they started singing and dancing on Turtle's back. And then they, the loon and the duck, and then other birds came in and they grabbed little particles of earth, just little specks, and they flew in the four directions. And with the singing and dancing, this little mound of dirt grew into Turtle Island. And I think I, let's see where, let's see, where was that map? There we go. Yeah, so you can kind of see the shape there with the Arctic, um, Labrador, Quebec, Florida down there, Mexico, Central America, Baja, and that's our sacred Turtle Island. So, this is a story that some call, oh, a quaint folk tale, as many anthropologists had. Oh, it's a cute children's story. But there are layers and layers of meaning when it's spoken in our Anishinaabemowin, in our Ojibwe language. Biology is now confirming that the muskrat, back to our little guy here, Wajashk, and in some of our interpretations of his name, Wajashk, it means courage. It means courage. And Wajashk is one of these rare water mammals that has the ability to slow its heart rate down, slow its blood pressure down, slow its need for oxygen, and sustain itself underwater for up to 15 minutes. So how did our Ojibwe ancestors know that? That's what we call traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous sciences, as opposed to settler sciences and Western sciences. We need all sciences, but it's plural, sciences. There's many different ways of knowing the earth and knowing our bodies and knowing the sky. And so they knew that Wajashk, this little animal, had this ability just like we do in meditation, right? We slow things down. So Ajashk was not only a bodhisattva, but a great meditator. Um, so that is why Muskrat is a great teacher for the Anishinaabe people and the Cree people. And again, Banaji Aki, Banaji Aki. Every year when we plant, 
and we will be planting here soon, planting life at Upaya, the new garden. Every year when we put that little mound of earth down, we remember that we are recreating life by putting the seeds in, praying for the rains, and cooperating with a whole team of people to do the planting cycle. Also, when we go into our sweat lodge ceremonies or any lodge, learning lodge, spirit lodge, our wigwams, they're shaped like that little mound of earth. So we go into that little mound of earth into the womb of our mother to go into that darkness. It's hot, sweaty, um, and we go inside and we go inside and we release, we compost what we need to, sweat it out, cry it out, and we come out of there like a fresh baby, all renewed, all reborn. And so that, there are all these analogs um, in links. Um, it's turtles all the way down, yeah. <gasps> with, with these relationships and lessons from this story. So did anyone go and spend a little time with a little paw full of soil or a stone? Anyone like to share what that experience was like? Right here. It was, um, it's really funny. We were sitting for lunch and all of a sudden I just had this almost compulsion to go to a very specific place that I knew nothing about. And um, I, the soil was so hot and the stone was so hot and I was holding it and feeling how hot it was and it began to rain. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so cool. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty auspicious. Yeah. yeah thank, you. thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And just wanted to share in how it's related to some of the themes we're discussing here in the symposium. We call these our original instructions. Um, these lessons and teachings, and every culture has them, every village, clan, but we forgot them. Many of us forgot these original instructions. So this is kind of our Ojibwe alg algorithms. Um, Minobima Dezewen is a very important concept of living the good way of life. It also means continuous rebirth. So we are here to um, recreate and work with creation so that life continues anew not just for us, but for everybody. And sometimes we are even sacrificed in the process. That's related to our seven ancestors teachings, which are our virtues that we strive to live up to. And this is also tied to our seventh fire prophecy that is very, very prophetic about these exact precarious times right now. I also don't have time to get into, we have a dish with one spoon treaty the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Confederacy were big nations, shared huge territory. We were often warring a bit, you know, struggling for shared resources. And finally, we decided to have a treaty amongst our, each other of peace and friendship, nation to nation. And no US, no British, no Dutch, no French, just indigenous to indigenous and the dish with one spoon. I think it's pretty explanatory what that means, but it's about sharing and cooperation. And this is related to another really primal and important original instruction of Turtle Island and that's Johekwo. That's from the Seneca Nation of the Haudenosaunee. And that is to always honor those that sustain us, our life sustainers. And that's corns, beans and squash, the three sisters. And in our Anishinaabe way of knowing, you see we're deeply tied in this concept of kinship in relationships with our clan system, as well as our genealogies and our cosmo genealogies, going back to those original animals like turtle. Um, we have a philosophy of holism uh, and interdependence. Things are always interconnected in the circles and cycles of life. Even though I have some issues with the word animism because it's been misused and interpreted, um, I think sometimes it is about animating life through the breath of life. Um, and so that breath of life is so key as we know for everything um, that we must honor and respect reciprocity to give and be given, to give and be given in that cycle, that holy cycle of exchange and sharing like our breath. 
and then also to practice regular um, regular practices of gratitude as you do here so beautifully. And now getting to more of the global system and a little more scholarly work, I've been involved with the project with some of my scholar friends at Arizona State University called From Syndemic to Symbiosis. We are in precarious times. We are in dystopic times. We are in apocalyptic times. Uh, and some have called this a syndemic, um, a converging of epidemics. I think it's a really interesting term that Joni Adamson and Stephen Hartman have defined as a synergy of epidemics that co-occur in time and place and interact with each other to produce complex pathological conditions that share common underlying societal drivers. So whether it's the housing crisis, the opioid crisis, political fascism, climate change, biodiversity loss, sadly, it's the list is too great. We are in a great syndemic. And how do we move towards reciprocal symbiosis between peoples, between species, between our biological systems and our cultural systems that have been split apart by you know, Cartesian dualism and all many different things we can argue about later. But um, I believe we need to move towards a biocultural symbiosis again, which indigenous peoples were not perfect. I'm not supporting the noble savage or the ecological Indian, but I do think that cultures who have lived in one place for more than 10, 20, 30,000 years have knowledge that will be important to settler society today for sustainability and for belonging. Another way of talking about this is I wrote a short kind of polemical piece on from conquest consciousness to kinship consciousness. Um, and really in Laura's terms, from world breaking to world making. I loved her emphasis that we actually have to break worlds to recreate new ones. Uh, indigenous peoples talk about decolonization, right? That's how we refer to it. But world breaking and micro breaks, I thought that was an awesome way of interpreting um, Varela's uh, assertion about that. So we know that there are many different layers of, of impact that are creating these destructive worlds these days rooted in colonialism imperialism i would say manifest in the othering of any other kind of people which sadly happens so often it's being you know legislated today officially othering peoples um i think that even though i have a love-hate relationship with western science as we started talking about with adam and molly last night you know the myth of the objective knower has to be really disrupted it has led to so much epistemic violence and epistemic hegemony and so working towards epistemic justice is very very critical to world making um, we have to see how that's entwined with this emphasis of predatory capitalism and accumulation and extractivism that is mining the earth, mining our bodies, mining the moon, mining celestial beings. This has to stop. And the only explanation from an Ojibwe perspective for that is they have been infected by the Wendigo virus or the Wetiko virus, which is a, a cannibal monster um, story from our oral narratives. Many traditions, again, have this. Winona LaDuke has been talking about Wendigo capitalism. And um, Robin Kimmerer was boldly even said of the last president, he was Wendigo in chief. <laughs> yes. Um, and the Wendigo has is insatiable, I guess, similar to the hungry ghosts of Buddhism. Yeah. And so how do we how do we dismantle the Wendigo? How, what kind of immunity do we have to the Wendigo virus? Uh, I think that the concentric worldviews of indigenous peoples and many traditional earth based peoples, we know it's not anthropocentric. We are not at the center. We should not be the ones. But we don't make the mistake of environmentalists too and go to a biocentric oh it's all about life without humans because humans will only make mistakes no 
we can harmonize, we can emulate, we can work with, um, we can cooperate. So the kin-centric worldviews of many indigenous peoples, I think, are critical. Um, that creates this participatory consciousness um, that we are porous, that our consciousness goes to and comes from the living earth and each other. And to invoke also responsibility, as Laura talked about, it's so beautiful to respond in the moment spontaneously, but to cultivate those virtues so that we can respond with intelligence and not react. Uh, again, really engendering more interspecies relationality and the way we treat animals, the way we learn from animals, the way we treat animals. Have those practices of gratitude and those ceremonies of world renewal and world making that again, right now, many cultures in the Pacific Northwest are having the spring salmon ceremonies, the first salmon ceremonies to welcome them up the rivers again, and to honor them and return them to the river. So it's not rocket science, but we have to change now because we know there is such a profound interrelationship of the genocide of people, the ecocide of the earth, and sadly, the femicide of women. And the, and the femicide, especially of indigenous and brown women um, that has to stop. And that is, we need to break that worldview, that practice, that power structure that continues that violence on the land and on our bodies. So, oh, sir. That is a pile of buffalo skulls that is symbolic of the slaughter of the genocide of the American bison, the buffalo, because it was such an important food source for especially the Plains tribal nations. And so when the first trains went through, they were the first people on them were told to shoot Indians and shoot buffalo. And so um, they just left carcasses to rot because they knew that it was the food source that my great grandfathers followed around to bring back to the people. So it's a symbol for us of, you know, the near extermination of many species. And now with the Buffalo Treaty, the Buffalo are coming back and indigenous peoples are resilient and returning. And we're struggling, but we're resilient and returning. Yeah, and the other picture is, uh, yeah, another example of just the, the miners, the settlers who came out um, were paid by the government to shoot natives and buffalo. Yeah. So that's part of why the word apocalypse is not scary to me. It's to reveal, it's to uncover. And there's been so much hidden dark history in America that has been seething underground. And it's time for these stories to come out. You can't heal a wound if it's festering, right? And unacknowledged, you need to acknowledge it and face it. So this idea of the syndemic and the poly crisis, you know, how do we transform this world? Uh, how do we create new worlds that are rooted in peace and Co peaceful coexistence, justice, diversity, health, flourishing, well-being. Um, for many scholars, some of my wonderful teachers, Daniel Wildcat and Kyle White, if you don't know their work, great native scholars. And they say, oh, this time is cultural deja vu. We've been here before. Even climate change, when you relocate the Mescalero Apache or the um, uh, other Apache like Geronimo's band from the Sonoran Desert to the swampy Everglades, that's climate change. They, they've been through climate change. It, when you relocate the Potawatomi from the Great Lakes and their woodlands to the plains of Oklahoma, that's climate change, that displacement. And many scholars have written about the disease of displacement and how um, critical that is and how for indigenous people, it's really how do we restore a sense of belonging when we have been displaced? So this is a colonial deja vu. It's not new to us. We, we have some skills and some tools for addressing these precarious times. Um, so the importance of prophecy, I'm going to just move on. Prophecy has foretold this time and said that we will be at a time where the winds get greater, 
the fires get greater, the floods get greater, humans will be killing each other, will be destroying each other, and we will be at a crossroads. It's a really long story. It often took seven days and seven nights to tell the seven fire prophecy. But you will see a map again of our sacred landscape, our geography, from the East Coast to the Great Lakes. <laughs> when a prophet said um, about a thousand years ago, maybe 1500 years ago, some say it was before the Vikings or some say after, when uh, our prophet said there is an evil wind coming across the great salty sea. And if you don't migrate west inland, we will perish. And so the people discussed this and decided they would follow the prophet's uh, warning and recommendation to start migrating inland. And they said, how will we know where to go? We're going to meet new people. And they said, you just go follow the water until you find the food that grows upon the water. And that is our sacred manomen or wild rice. But there's many different stories. And that's when the Anishinaabe um, broke off with the Wabanaki and the Abenaki and then the Potawatomi. You can all hear in the words, right? Similarity, They're all, we're all relatives and the Ottawa and then ended up in the Minnesota area where the food grows upon the water. And that's the seventh fire prophecy. So they talk about different metaphoric fires, literal fires, historic migrations, and consciousness shifts. And um, we are in the seventh fire right now, about to light the eighth fire. The seventh fire is this time of great destruction, but also a time where, you know, urban mixed bloods like myself are going back and picking up the stories and the seeds and the traditions and putting ourselves back together again, remembering to remember. And as we remember, we are building resurgence to hopefully light this eighth fire. But as our prophets and many storytellers say, we can't light this eighth fire without the cooperation of our light skinned relatives. That's in that's an interpretation of it and that we can't do it without industrial society, basically, obviously, because of the impacts of technology. So let's help light the eighth fire, because this crossroads is one of a green soft path with lots of animals. The other one they say is dark and sharp and chalky and like mica and uh, but not pretty mica like sharp mica and also ash, of course, from the fires. So this is the crossroads that we're at right now. And again, those seven ancestors teachings, many, many stories related to this, but they're kind of like our commandments or our virtues um, to always strive for honesty, for wisdom for truth, to practice humility, like little Wajashk, to practice love, to be brave in the face of dangerous times, and to respect one another. And they're all related, again, to different animal teachers. So what I'm supporting here is that these stories and a lot of indigenous scholars and leaders and medicine people are sharing, we need to really shift our understanding of our relationships, not just with one another, but with the more than human world. And to again invoke Laura's great emphasis on listening more, listening more deeply, listening not just with the cognitive mind, listening with the heart, listening with the stomach, listening with the feet, listening with our whole being. It requires us to be very vulnerable, right? To listen that deeply and to be courageous enough to give what we have when others are needing and to receive when others give to us. Um, to be willing to be challenged and changed, you know, to question those fundamental assumptions or those tacit infrastructures, those unconscious beliefs when we know we should do better, but we keep making the same mistake. What is that? I need the cognitive scientists and the psychologists to help with that. And as I love to say, embrace getting dirty with your place. Get out there and engage. Uh, and I wrote a piece about um, eco-eroticism, actually, um, that may, if some of you are interested in that, you may want to check out. Um, the Honorable Harvest is a beautiful teaching I don't have time to get into right now, but you can find it in Robin Kimmerer's wonderful book, Braiding Sweetgrass. There's many different versions of it, but it's again these original instructions for how to be a good ancestor, how to be a good relative, how to be in good relation. 
and to conclude, we can create worlds of multi-species belonging. We really can. Um, Native people demonstrate this so often, other traditional cultures, Buddhist cultures. We have many good examples and models of how to recreate belonging in precarious times. Uh, we make sense of the world through reciprocal relationships with the more than human world of living beings. And for us as Anishinaabe with the unseen Manitous, um, which are the spirits, the unseen world is very important to us as well. And I wanted to end with this great word, zagigi, zagigi. And that's what's happening right now with all the leaves coming out and the leaves budding and the flowers unfurling and the, the, the life coming back from brown earth. And in our Ojibwe language, this is the zagigya gizis. This is the name of our moon. It's how we talk about our time. It's early spring in the north, later spring in the south. And it means they sprout, they come up, they emerge, they grow out of the ground. But it's rooted in our same word, uh, zagidawin, which is love. So it is literally the Mother Earth showing her love for us that every year she shares those green sprouts with us, she shares those flowers with us. So even though there is great turmoil and precariousness. I have faith in the power and resilience of uh, Mother Earth. So, Chimigwich, thank you so much for listening. Wow. <laughs> Zagigi indeed. So I just want to- Zagigi. <laughs> I just want to invite Roshi up for some reflections. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Oh, no. I need a mic. <clears throat> we have a lavalier up there. They do not see a lavalier. Here, here. I, I, can, I can handle it. You sure. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> so wonderful to uh, hear from within M Melissa's world. You know, epistemologies are ways of knowing, and. Um, I, I recall uh, Wendy Johnson, our master gardener in the back, and good friend of Melissa's and good friend of Upaya's, who usually farms, you know, on the California coast, but has actually um, made this her part-time home in this high desert landscape to bring forth life, particularly of the three sisters. But in any case, um, just to um, have the opportunity to switch out of our own view. And Laura, in a way, pointed her finger at it in this term, shared sentience. Mm -hmm. And I loved that term. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you you just alluded to it. You, well, well, actually, more than alluded to it, you uh, were it in the sense that, you know, Molly brought forth the relationship between the elements inside and outside. Um, we felt it in relation to the land, um, the mm -hmm. elements, but also the creatures. And I'm remembering Wendy um, when, you know, I've struggled with this building next door. No. You know, this is a wonderful thing. I said, I hope it's done before I'm dead. But anyway, uh, that's an optimistic appraisal. Oh. <laughs> no, no, it case, will be. I asked my adopted brother, uh, Joe David, who's uh, Nuchal Nuth, um, uh, to, uh, to pray in that building. And um, it was such a beautiful time. It was in the winter and uh, Wendy was there and, and uh, the other Wendy is Wendy, Wendy Broshi <laughs> and Joe, and he's a great Northwest Coast carver. And we were adopted by grandfather Black Elk uh, decades ago, and now we're old. And, um, you know, he, he did what you did. I mean, he said, uh, you know, it's bringing life to life, what Dogen yes. talks about. I mean, Ehe Dogen was so clear. He planted his monastery in this uh, fecund 
uh, valley, mountain valley. And um, he used this uh, phrase, giving life to life. And so what does life include? Well, it includes everything, including the Holocaust. Yeah. And, you know, this is so, uh, Weir's story um, is such a powerful example of, uh, you know, this sort of tragedy we, we all know and has been known ever since, you know, whatever. Uh, human beings started objectifying the world. And so, you know, something, I, again, this shared sentience, it's like, a, in a way, a, a, a directive uh, mm. from all beings, uh, which, you know, you brought forth in that story, for us to, as Laura said, and as you said, to not be displaced. The word displaced means a part from place. And, and you know, in our nomadic world today, we are so displaced. We are apart from place. And I was sitting next to Wendy, uh, who was born and raised you know, till an adolescent in Hong Kong, she came to the United States, but it's been, you know, like many of us or you, actually I've only lived in three places in 80 years. So that's not too that's bad. That's pretty good. Not, not bad, but um, your ancestors, mm. uh, they lived their whole lifespan yeah. in one place. So you are embedded in the context of your lived experience. You are not apart from. So Wendy from Hong Kong, I feel like I'm corrupting you with goodness. <laughs> that, uh, um, uh, when Laura was talking and I could feel her urging forward again, it's not being the nomad that you were, but it's uh, your love of the refuge, your attention to the elk. When we go walking, you know, mm -hmm. in the mountains uh, and everybody, when you're new and doing it uh, with us, it's like, what are you people doing? We're looking for shit, <laughs> yeah. you know? Why? Every step is some kind yes. of scat. And we get yes. down there and, what, he, well, Noah's really good at it, Kodo. He just, <laughs> he, he pokes at the shit. What's with, what? Okay, that coyote, coyote. coyote's been eating bowls, you know? Uh -huh. That's not being displaced. Mm -hmm. That is living in a world where we experience directly shared sentience. And it's not just with the creatures. No. For example, um, in our refuge, just looking at um, what are they called? The uh, cadres of uh, Aspen? Quartets. No. It's another thing. It's another thing <laughs> where where one whole pod of aspen share one genetic oh, they're signature. They're clones. They're clones. Yeah. And Wendy and I out there watching say, "Oh yes, that family, that clone. You know, look at they're leafing early. Oh, those over there in the fall, they turn red, and suddenly it's in your body." Because one of the things about the inactive view is that it's not only embedded in context, but it's embodied. Mm -hmm. We're drinking the rainwater coming mm -hmm. off the roof, you know, mm -hmm. just like your, mm -hmm. your, your uh, ancestors did. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that I asked, um, which I think is, you know, uh, so beautifully exemplified in what uh, Laura was pointing to, it's interesting, we've got three women lining up on top of you, John. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's nothing like being planful sometimes. <laughs> there was no accident in the design of this. <laughs> but it's, you know, the, the experience of embodiment, where, you know, women bleed from the middle yes. of their bodies and don't die. And I mean, it's a miracle, or, you know, from between their legs comes another human being. And their breasts filled with milk. I mean, it's just the miracle of mm. life that is in uh, the a feminine body. And then you were pointing to toxic narratives that are embedded mm -hmm. in the patriarchal, colonial, extractive, consumeristic culture. And how important yes. it is to actually understand in both, yeah, uh, 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 you know, all three of our women, who, I, I'm also uh, in that category, um, you know. Uh, have to do with the recognition of the of toxic narratives 
and the willingness to actually take on those narratives and to work with them transformationally, knowing those toxic narratives represent views, represent states of consciousness that are no longer tolerable in the conditions that we're living in now. And this is, you know, this is very deep, hard work. And it is replacing, if you will, with healthy narratives. And my good friend, Rebecca Solnit, who will be here next month, Rebecca, who's uh, just amazing. And with Christiana Fuguedes, we're doing a, a thing together that's, and you know, it is how do we actually um, re-narratize? Because our narratives um, shape the world. And the world then comes back at us and shapes us, affects us deeply. And we see this in terms of the destruction of ecosystems and what you were talking about, uh, uh, Melissa, um, you know, the sort of liberation of deep viruses, you know, within the ecologies suddenly coming you know, and finding nice habitats. <laughs> Hi. Um, you know, I've been a habitat recently, I'll tell you, it wasn't that much fun. Another piece that I think is really important has to do with time. And, you know, one of the problems that I think we have in our uh, Western view, and you certainly pointed it out in terms of the, the sort of most indigenous views have this notion of time, is our notion of time is based on poverty. We don't have enough of it. There's not the experience of long time. You have referenced again and again your ancestors. How many of us can name our great grandmothers, what are their names, her names, our great great grandmother, and yet the sense of long time, and also even longer time, you know, because this is pre human that you're speaking about. So, okay, mm -hmm. there were the bugs and then yeah, us, yeah. you know. So, there's a whole different notion of time that reminds me of this kind of bad joke. This is a bad joke, this is a Dalai Lama joke. Somebody told me, uh, it, was a Dalai Lama joke, but I, anyway, I always told this one. Um, and uh, somebody supposedly asked his holiness the Dalai Lama, well, well, what do you think of the French Revolution? And uh, his holiness said, it's too early to tell. <laughs> <laughs> and another one I loved was, this, you know, these are all those Beethoven and Einstein quotes that are apocryphal, so I don't care. But anyway, this is probably another apocryphal quote. This one is, um, uh, uh, his holiness was asked, well, what do you want to be reborn as? And he said, well, if there aren't too many problems in the world, I want to be reborn as a meadow. Oh. That's pretty cool from a guy who came where there aren't any meadows, I'll tell you. But anyway, so I don't believe the story, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't represent his, his embeddedness in any way. You know, um, you use the word, uh, you, you, you um, uh, uh, um, shared the, the word totem. And yeah, I'm an old, I'm a recovering anthropologist from 50, 50 years ago. Good Lord, deliver us. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we were participant observers. We were extractive as hell. I mean, I will be honest. We were. Go I'm even embarrassed salvaging. to take photographs. Salvaging cultures, you know, it was just. And but we had this participant observer <laughs> kind of thing, <laughs> as though you know we could be both, and that was not true. And now you have to get an IRB to even take a photo of an indigenous yes. person. But anyway, that's all right. The word totem is so fascinating. I never knew this, that um, it actually means heart. Yes. I'd love you to say just a little bit more about that, because that mm. really struck me. Mm. Please. OK, I, I think my audio is still on. Yes. Yeah, I don't, okay. you got that too. Yes, well, I've been trying to study some Ojibwe language and grammar. I mean, I started about 30 years ago. It's it's in the Guinness Book of World Lang uh, Guinness Book of World of Records for being one of the most complex, difficult languages to learn, because one word can be about 30 or 40 letters long. It's it's polysyllabic with all these prefixes, preverbs. Anyway, it's fascinating, and but Ode. 
a heart is a pretty simple one. So I started with something simple and we have like Ode Min, which is the good berry or the heart berry, which is strawberry. Mm. So we're coming up to Ode Min Gizis, the heart berry moon, which is June, when the little wild strawberries start to show up. Our name for our village is related to the heart as well, Odena. Odena, the, the village is where the heart is. And then with the totem or dodem, nindodem, piju nindodem, that would be, I'm related to the links. It's in my heart, but it was also acknowledging that sometimes mothers died, sometimes fathers died, sometimes you were an orphan, sometimes you didn't have your biological family around you. And that's why we did a lot of traditional adoption, but you always had your clan family. So even if your biological family somehow got displaced, some got taken to boarding school, some got died young, whatever it was, you had your heart in your clan system. Wherever I go, I can find other people from the Lynx clan and I'm related to them and their family, even though genetically, biologically, we're completely distinct. You can find your heart there in your totem, in your dodem. Well, that's how I feel here. Yes, and we you create know, it. In, in this space, um, uh, and I think sometimes people can feel it coming here. And also it's how I feel in the refuge. I don't feel displaced apart from place or here not apart from place. And this is, you know, I think what is so critical, the restlessness, the sort of windigo, the culture bound reactive oh. syndrome that has really um, taken uh, hold of not just people in uh, the Western world, um, but th this is running hither and thither. One of the symptoms of Wendigo is, you know, it's not just the hungry ghost, uh, this sort of mind of poverty, but is also just running hither and thither, thither, a negative connotation of aimlessness, just, you know, and Joe Campbell for jumping from wave to wave in search of wetness you know, never settling down. And so, you know, it's, this is one of the powers of practice. Um, because, you know, basically, in, for, you know, from the Buddhist perspective, um, we say, uh, you know, when you uh, become a, a, you know, take vows, so to speak, um, you know, at a kind of more determined level, you become a home lever. Why? Because every place that you go then um, is exactly where you are home. But that's a little different, I will say, than um, uh, your body, uh, because of embeddedness in the natural world, becoming of the earth, of, of the water, of the sky, of the stars. Really, um, it's really different. And so how you know, your question is, is how do we actually create, you know, an ethos of uh, connection, care, and kin and cooperation, you know, these four things that allows us to uh, come home within ourselves to absolve ourselves of the sense of restlessness of not enough of our extractive disease. Anyway, I'm ranting because I had some chocolate. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Probably from West Africa. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, just, uh, I want to thank you so much because you know, we sit in our epistemologies of science. And, you know, we move through the inactive perspective that many of us hold from the third to the first person view of our lived experience, which I, you did and I did, tried to do in my old little white lady way. Uh, I always make fun of myself, excuse me. No, no, you don't have to feel sorry for me. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> But you know the, the work that, um, uh, in a certain way, uh, that we get to do is um, to create a kind of uh, landscape of cooperation between, you know, first, second, and third persons. You know, to appreciate the brilliance of science and to know anything that science is revealed today, tomorrow might be disrupted, and um, we. Uh, ultimately have to live with this kind of heart of nimbleness, you know, the capacity to um, uh, exercise freely in the inevitable changes 
that uh, have always happened, but are happening in a more visible and accelerated way. And that I think, you know, was so beautifully exemplified in your, the emphasis on prophecy in your culture. So thank you so much. Dear And I see my friend Vipul Saha is here from India. Oh, Namaste. Oh, welcome, Vipul. Yay! Talk about nomad leaving northern India. Here you are. Yeah, we're really happy to see you. And good. Thank you, Kozan, for picking up my beloved or our beloved Richie introduced Vipul to our world. So, okay. Now um, we're going to take uh, a uh, five minute break. And is that right? Maybe go to 20 after. Seven yeah, we're going after four o'clock. So um, what time is it now? 10 after or 11 after. 10 after, 11 after. Yeah, I think we should take a 10, but we're going to uh, go past four o'clock. And the amazing Molly Crockett is going to dance uh, all of this together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And this is like, women all the way down except for john <laughs> okay enjoy your break uh, thank you dear.